hopefully this means we can have more time for dialogue. Uh, my name is Jeff Nugent, and uh, this is my colleague Sandy Stewart, and we're both from the Industry Training Authority in British Columbia. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about wh what that is and what we do, but we just wanted to uh, start off our session with a little bit of uh, uh, a video clip to hopefully whet your appetite, and then we'll explain uh, a little bit more about our, uh, our presentation today. I love being able to create things. I just love the way flavors work together and so many interesting things you can do with food. And I wanted to have a job that I loved. I heard about the MAP program from my boss. She suggested that I try it as just a way to get some sort of certification. And all I had to do is take the time to fill out forms and, you know, take this one hour interview and take a day off for the exam. It was very easy. And the practical exam, there was a lot of work. I just barely finished in six hours. The assessors were really great. They come around while you're working and they talk to you about what you're doing. One of the most exciting moments for me was when I was doing it. And Bruno Marti told me that my fish dish was sublime. <laughs> I felt really good. That's when I knew I was doing okay. The multiple assessment pathways cater to your strengths. The people doing the assessment want you to succeed. Once I had that red seal, almost immediately things were set in motion and I was given promotion. I think that employers are looking for a way to, to gauge your skill level. It's like getting your chef's license or something, you know. It's official. You can be a chef now. My parents, my friends, my coworkers, everyone was just really proud. So, uh, <laughs> That gives you a little bit uh, of a sense of what it is we're here to talk about. It's a pilot that was run in British Columbia, um, and uh, in this particular pilot had to do with Cook, but we've actually worked on some other trades that we'll talk about. And so we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the research we did and, and what led up to this pilot, how that went, and uh, what we're working on now, and some of the national implications of, of the work that uh, was done. Uh, so I, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background and uh, Sandy is going to talk to you about the pilot itself and our experience and what we learned in BC. Uh, but, but just uh, I think it's important from the get-go to be very clear that uh, we as a government agency, uh, we didn't just run this pilot on our own. It very much was a partnership with industry and in this case, of course, the hospitality industry. So the, the two key uh, partners in this project that we're going to talk about were the Industry Training Authority. That's us. We are uh, a crown agency of the BC government and essentially we're a standards assessment and credentialing body and so in our province we have the mandate for the apprenticeship system uh, both for apprenticeship training but also for assessment and credentialing um, of, of the trades and for those of you who know a little bit about the trades um, uh, there are national standards even though apprenticeship of course is a provincial jurisdiction and, and the national standards uh, um, it's called the Red Seal program. So some of you may be familiar with that. And most of the high volume trades in Canada do have national standards and, and that includes Cook. The other partner was uh, an organization in British Columbia called Go To, and that's a hospitality and tourism training organization. Uh, and they work very closely with us to ensure that we have alignment between what we're doing and what the needs of industry are. So what we'll try and cover here, uh, just and again, I won't spend too much time on, on the upfront stuff because I think it's more interesting to hear about the actual pilot, but I, just a little bit of the history, some of the key concepts that we operated on, and most of these concepts will be more familiar to you probably than some of the audiences that we've been working with on this in the apprenticeship world. Uh, and then, of course, Sandy's going to talk to you about... Uh, how the pilot worked, what we did specifically, um, focusing on the assessment and how that went. So in terms of why, why did we decide, and, and I think it's important um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the apprenticeship world in, in Canada to, to be aware that in Canada the primary means to become certified in a trade is by writing a multiple choice written examination. And it's been that way for a long, 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 long time. 
So uh, up until very recently when we did this pilot, the only way that somebody could actually get a national Red Seal endorsement or even a provincial credential in the trades was to pass a written multiple choice exam, generally consisting of 120 questions. So um, for numerous reasons, that was not uh, completely satisfactory for this industry, and we had some pressure on us as well um, to try something new. Uh, from the industry uh, perspective, if I can speak on behalf, they uh, were concerned that um, a multiple choice exam is not necessarily an effective measure of practical competency. And, you know, I think that's fairly intuitive. And uh, they talked about paper chefs, and these were people who held the Red Seal credential, which is a, you know, meant to be a very high national standard, but in fact couldn't function in a, a kitchen. So they did very well on their written assessments. They were carrying this piece of paper out there, and the, and the issue was that industry wasn't valuing that as they once did because it didn't signal that the person could actually cook. Um, from from our sort of broader perspective, uh, of course, um, there's uh, you know the condition the the, uh, the pending skill shortage, the fact that we're having to draw on less traditional sources of labor, uh, an increase in uh, foreign trained workers. A lot of general um, uh, changes to the climate that we operate in that meant that we really needed to start looking at better ways of assessing individuals and recognizing their skills. And um, so in, in that regard, this industry and us as an organization in the province of BC, we had a common uh, goal, and that was to come up with a better way of doing things for assessing and credentialing individuals in the trades in particular, to test that with this particular trade, which is the cook trade. Now, this, um, this probably for you, this, this lists a lot of the common misunderstandings or some of the barriers that we faced over the last couple of years working in the apprenticeship world, uh, testing out a new way of assessing. And uh, hopefully this, uh, this presentation will dispel some of those, and I'm not sure if you would actually share them in the first place, but there has been a notion that anything other than the written multiple choice exam is in essence a lowering of the standard and we argue adamantly that's uh, in fact the, the inverse that we've actually increased the standard. Um, there has been the misunderstanding that the objective here is to get more people through the exam, more people certified and again we would argue that it's about getting the right people certified. It's not about increasing a pass rate or reducing a pass rate, it's about giving everybody a fair opportunity to demonstrate their competency and ensuring only those who are competent get certified. Um, there's also a notion in the apprenticeship world that uh, some people actually find the term competency to be offensive. They think that it's about uh, performing in one instance and then never again and getting certified on that basis and they're very nervous about that. Uh, and, and that's linked to this notion that um, traditionally in Canada, the way somebody becomes certified, it's based on the number of hours they've worked in an occupation. That's what would qualify you to write a multiple choice exam. And uh, a lot of people in the apprenticeship world are terrified that this time requirement will disappear. So you're all familiar with these concepts, but we did, uh, just, just to kind of uh, give you some background, we did operate... Um, off of this definition of competency, which is the convergence of knowledge, skills, uh, and attitudes. We called them attributes here because we were having some confusion. Turned out attributes wasn't a very helpful term uh, either, so we'll call them attitudes for the sake of today because I've, I've heard that used uh, quite a lot. And as you know, competency is really focused largely on outcomes uh, and the application of knowledge, um, skills, and, and attributes together in a workplace setting in the case of, of what we were working on. In terms of the dimensions of competency, we operated off of this mo model that there's really four dimensions that we were uh, aware of when we were doing this work. Contingency management skills, uh, task skills, task management skills, and uh, role and environmental skills. Um, task skills maybe being the most obvious, and that's the ability to perform the task uh, to a required standard. Task management skills is the ability of an individual to uh, manage multiple tasks. Contingency skills is problem solving or uh, coming up with contingencies when things do not go according to plan. And job role environmental skills is the aspect of actually um, being able to work in a team and work in a workplace environment to, to apply all of these, um, these things. So 
So just to give you a sense again, this is sort of what I was, was trying to express is the apprenticeship world in Canada um, for, for the Red Seal and most of the jurisdictions um, looks not exclusively but largely like this currently and that is the idea that there's some sort of standards, occupational standards, but generally at least at the Red Seal level those standards have been designed for the purpose of writing multiple choice exams. So they're really geared towards producing a good uh, multiple choice examination. And of course, uh, the objective is somebody goes through that form of assessment and uh, receives a certification if they're successful. Uh, w what we were working with is a model that looked a little bit more like this. And this was the concept of having standards that more broadly support not only skill uh, recognition and not only with one tool, but broadly support the notion of skill recognition. So using a numerous assessment tools, but also can support more effectively the acquisition of skills and that these things in combination would still lead to the outcome of certification. We also, uh, just by way of background, and, and I think Sandy will touch on this, we learned early on, uh, when we approached this, we approached it from the perspective of wanting to try better forms of assessment. Uh, we quickly learned that you uh, cannot do that if you do not have good occupational standards. So. Uh, what started out as an assessment, research, and pilot really took us into the world of developing uh, good quality occupational performance standards as a foundation for anything, whether it be assessment um, or, or skill acquisition. Now, okay, I wasn't sure if that, what that was going to do, but we also uh, currently, uh, the, the standards for the trades in Canada are called uh, na national occupational analyses. And those things are one chunk. It's, it's sort of like one unit for the entire trade. And so when we were doing this work and the standards that led up to us being able to do the pilot, we really looked at an approach where uh, the standards would be organized into um, units of competency, we called them, and uh, kind of look like blocks here or, or Lego pieces. And of course, the utility there uh, was that um, an individual could be assessed and it would be possible to identify areas of competency, but also um, areas of deficiency and individuals could proceed on, I suppose, the journey of filling their skill gaps. Currently, the way it works is an individual writes this multiple choice exam and if they score less than 70%, they fail. And generally, there's no further feedback uh, beyond that. And some jurisdictions may give a general indication of the areas of the exam they did poorly on, but it doesn't necessarily set them up to go any further. And in fact, we know anecdotally that people who have been out of the training system for a number of years and who build up the courage to write this exam, uh, particularly if they've been practicing their trade successfully, when they fail, it's often the last we hear of them. And it's, it's, it's no surprise, I would say. The other reason that we like uh, the uh, having units, of course, is the fact that there is uh, overlap and there is uh, repetition of certain competency areas between trades. This example is probably a more obvious one, and that's uh, there is a Red Seal trade called Cook and Baker, and there are, in fact, a number of competency uh, units that overlap. And so for a number of reasons, both from the development perspective and the time that's invested in developing these occupational performance standards, the time that industry invests in developing them, but also the idea of transferability of, of credits between trades, which currently um, uh, is a little bit hit or miss because we don't have a way of identifying common pieces. And the way the standards are developed is they're, they're developed in isolation. So you get this problem where they're, they're uh, written subtly different. So it really becomes a difficult exercise to identify where there may be common units of competency. So again, you know, this just again kind of illustrates how the current system looks graphically. And we've used the example of those two trades. We've really got two whole chunks. There's no kind of breaking up or identifying similarities within the two trades currently. And um, although some of my colleagues would argue that that multiple choice exam does in fact assess practical competency, I would argue that it probably does uh, doesn't really do a good job of uh, assessing practical performance because it's a written multiple choice exam. Uh, it in fact focuses, I would argue, fairly exclusively on the knowledge realm of competency. And it probably does a good job of that. But again, the only outcome uh, that you can have with the current system is a pass or a fail. Um, the other thing that's interesting is uh, the 70% pass mark is 70% of any of these questions on 
uh, these multiple choice certification exams. So uh, I like to use the example of there's a trade in Canada called auto service tech. That's basically uh, an auto mechanic. And there are 11% uh, of the questions on the Red Seal certification exam are on brakes and braking systems. So theoretically, a person could fail every single question on brakes and still be certified as a Red Seal mechanic and uh, service, service your vehicle. Which we think is a bit of a problem. So the, the, the kind of proposed model we were looking at is to broaden the focus on just knowledge and to, to assess knowledge, skills, and attitudes or attributes, but to use a range of tools. And really, uh, the whole model is, uh, is um, structured on the concept of collecting evidence of competency against the standards and the fact that you will use different ways of collecting different pieces of evidence. So this is where we might argue a written multiple choice exam is not a good tool to collect evidence of uh, practical competency. It is a good tool for collecting evidence of knowledge, and so that's really our approach is using multiple tools. The other thing is uh, we thought it was important that you be able to specify those areas of competency that are critical. So you may have uh, you know, a core and elective type structure for a trade, but probably breaks would be a mandatory area that somebody would need to be competent in before receiving their certification. So this again represents what we were going for, the idea that you have this library of units, they get assembled into trade credentials. We're not talking about breaking down existing trades, we're just talking about how we structure the standards. Attempting to do a better job, certainly of assessing knowledge and skills and uh, attitudes where possible, and we, we learned that that's, that, that, that's a, particular, uh, a particularly difficult dimension to measure. Uh, and the other important distinction is that the outcome not be a pass or a fail. Um, in fact, we tried not to use the word fail throughout our pilot. Uh, we talked about not yet competent and identifying areas of competency in areas where people are not yet competent. The idea being that they can then go and fill those areas. So I kind of rushed through that piece because I think um, you folks as practitioners of PLAR or, or people familiar with it understand the concepts. I think the more interesting part is probably what Sandy's going to walk us through now, which is how these concepts, when we applied them in the case of the cook, actually played out. So I will turn it over to Sandy to go over that. Yeah, sure. Well, what is it? Yeah. What, what it was in our pilot, and Sandy will talk about how it played out, but in theory what it is, is it is um, a conversation or an interview with somebody who is both a trained assessor but also a subject matter expert. And what they're, again, that's another tool to extract evidence. So the idea is sort of in the, uh, the purest form of this model, which isn't exactly how we implemented, that an individual would prepare something like a portfolio. Um, they may also have an, a written exam, but early on they would sit down with an assessor and the assessor would have a conversation with them about their experience and would also be drawing out evidence of, of areas they're strong in, areas that perhaps they have less experience. They would be doing this perhaps around the portfolio submitted, but they would be, again, they would be, they would be mapping back to the occupational standards. And what that input to the assessor might do is give them an insight into how best to design the further assessment of the individual. So somebody with a lot of practical experience uh, who's weak on theory, this, the follow-on uh, evidence collection activities may focus on the theory. So that's kind of the, how ideally it would work. Um, you'll see for, you know, for economies of scale, it wasn't possible to have a custom assessment for each individual, but we still use that competency conversation. Okay, so we did, um, we, we, we did some research and then we wanted to pilot it and see how it worked in practice. One of the first things that we did was we went um, and through our research, we were looking for somebody to help us do this. So we hired um, what we like to call as an expert advisor and they helped us to build a model that worked in BC and was based on international best practices. Our goal was to recruit and assess candidates with little formal um, education or training in, in a trade and um, also do some people who had been unsuccessful in, in that last step of passing that multiple choice for their, for their certification. We wanted to develop and trial um, the different standards and the different way of documenting those standards in the workplace and try out this, uh, this new approach to assessment. So why the cook trade? Well, there was, um, 
there was some reason why the cook trade had the right ingredients to help make the recipe and bake this cake. <coughs> I couldn't resist. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> so the the cooks were really they were a good choice because Propel, their the industry training organization, had already been engaged with them on updating the trade. And um, they and they continued um, year after year to be um, to be to be facing the challenge of a fair amount of challengers, people who, who, who hadn't come through an apprenticeship program but wanted the credential, and they were repeatedly um, certifying these people based on that exam and proof of time in the trade, and they were ending up with these paper chefs who, who got hired but effectively could not perform to the standard that industry wanted in the kitchen. So. They, had, they were already engaged, um, they were already receptive, and they wanted to move ahead in terms of incorporating more practical assessment. The specific pilot objectives were to demonstrate the value of this alternative assessment methodology. Um, we wanted to develop some new tools in the cook trade for the cooks to use, and we wanted to develop in-house expertise. So we didn't want somebody to come in and do it for us. We wanted somebody to come in and guide us in doing it for ourselves so that we could learn, and then we could go on and, and do it in other trades. So Matthew, Matthew is one of the uh, challengers who went through the process, and we just thought it would be uh, interesting for you to hear Matthew's story. I have a really big focus on locality of food. I love the seasonality of products and how you get sort of two weeks with local asparagus. So that's kind of my dream is to have a small restaurant where I can focus on locally grown products. I was in the middle of a shift at the hotel and my chef came down and pulled me out of my shift and brought me up to uh, one of the information sessions that was in Victoria. First you have to fill out a, a good bit of paperwork detailing your previous experience, where you've worked, who you worked with. You go to what's called a competency conversation and then there's a small written examination that you do at the same time. Because it is a practical examination, the food is going to be kept in a more contemporary level. You're not going to be talking about dishes that were done 30 years ago. You're going to be doing more modern food. And you really do need accreditation to be gaining the experience needed to run your own establishment. The primary reason that I went through the multiple assessment pathways was to try to use the experience that I'd already gained and show at what level I am already at. But it definitely has lent a little bit more viability to my career as far as my parents' outlook on it. I love the celebration and the feeling of family that you get sitting around a table with people that you care about. and It gives something concrete that my family can see and be proud of. So the project consisted of a number of stages, and we produced effectively a suite of resources. And these are the books um, that are shown on the slide there. The first one was uh, about the assessment system itself. So that information can, or that book contains all kinds of information about if we were to roll this out across the trades as a real system, what kind of policies do we have in place? What would the appeal um, process look like? The whole quality assurance framework. What are the roles and responsibilities? What's the administrative system that's required to, to support it? That's what that resource is, is all about. In addition, there were uh, roughly um, four, four or five resources that were directed at the challengers and at the assessors to help them go through the challenge process or the assessment process. So we had, a, we had the standards themselves, and that was a big, thick document of about this big. Uh, the occupational performance standards, we had the assessment tools, which we called the assessment toolkit, and um, we had an assessor guide for the assessor that told the assessor all about their role and how to do their, um, their job, the assessment. We developed an assessor training program itself and trained the assessors, and we had an information kit and briefing sessions for the challengers. So one of the key principles of the assessment strategy is that it's transparent. So the, the challenger understands the standard to which they're being measured, and they understand the process that they're going to go through. Very unlike the current, um, the current approach, which is top secret, we don't share anything. 
uh, on the exam, except for the candidate does have access to the national occupational analysis. This process, totally wide open. And then we did the, um, we did the, assess the assessments themselves. So when it comes to the assessment system, we asked industry, we started by wanting to build this picture of competence. So we said, if, if, there was, if, if you had to determine if somebody was competent, what would you do? And in fact, in the discussion that ensued, it became, became obvious that the assessment strategy was similar to what they already did when they hired people. It, was, it, was, it, it had the same um, common feel to them. So they had hiring practices where they reviewed somebody's experience through a resume, let's say. They conducted an interview. And in some cases, they would do a practical, some sort of a practical evaluation. And in, and in management positions, you would be expected to also write uh, a test, a written test. So they looked at the skills in particular that needed to be identified. They built those skills into the standards and then they built the tools. And some of the, some of the key learnings that we took away from that process were that you know, we need to put industry in their comfort zone in order for them to buy into this process. And, it, and, and in fact, we, we are finding that it's relatively easy for industry to buy into this because it is so realistic and it, and it is in their comfort zone because, like I was saying, it mimics the hiring process and they, and they, get, they get comfort from that. They're familiar with those processes. Um, we want to make the process as realistic as possible and, again, the focus on being clear about what it is we're going to measure, developing the standards that represent that, and then having the, the assessment strategy and the tools to conduct the assessment. The standards really are the key. Um, and we, we've talked a lot, and Jeff talked a lot about, they're the foundational piece. Without the standards, you have nothing to measure against, and you have nothing to define what it is you're measuring. So the cook industry, it, it was the good choice because the industry was already there, they were asking for it, they had recently engaged in updating their curriculum. What we had to do was take them from realizing what curriculum was to realizing what occupational performance standards are, and that was primarily about inserting the performance um, standard piece. So not only being able to identify what the task is or what the, what the whole work activity is, but to what standard, how well do you have to do this job in order to be considered competent in the workplace. Uh, some of the key learnings in that area in terms of building the standards was to base the standards on how people actually work in the industry and how they progress through their careers. And we need to be as specific as possible about the performance criteria. This is what an actual um, standard looks like. And uh, it's, a, it's a competency unit, so you can see it's fairly specific. It describes in the description, it has a title, it has a description that describes the work outcome. It has what's called elements, they, they describe the key tasks that make up the activity. Then there are performance criteria. There's a range statement that outlines the conditions and requirements for the activity. And there's an assessment guide. And again, all that is to provide information to both the challenger, so they know what they're being assessed, but also to the assessor, so that they have a frame of reference against what they're seeing and measuring and gathering as evidence. And this is a really critical piece because one of the key, um, one of the key pieces of resistance or the arguments that we get levied against us on this approach is it's too subjective. It's you know it, 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 it's subjective and you know it's it's it may be more subjective than a written multiple choice exam. But it's not like the book is wide open. We're operating here with a trained assessor, and there are documented standards that guide the assessor in making the decision. <clears throat> so what about the assessors themselves? Well, the first thing um, we had to have is we knew we had to have quality assessors. We also had to have selection criteria for them. So the industry decided who would be these assessors, and they were looking for people who are already certified in the trade. So these are Red Seal certified. They're experienced, and they decided that they need to have a minimum of 10 years experience. Now that could, could include their training time as an apprentice. They needed to be really good communicators, so they have strong communication skills. And then they needed to be trained in assessment. And that's another, you know, that's another mitigation against the whole subjectivity argument. These aren't just certified tradespeople that are out there working. They're actually trained on how to assess people. And they're trained on 
how to gather evidence, and how to use professional judgment to, 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 to make a determination in terms of competency. So the, the training program, the assessor training program itself, um, it was, it included things like the principles of competency-based assessment, some of which the Jeff already talked about, the principles of evidence, that the evidence needs to be current and reliable and valid and fair, and, and the assessors need to be trained on how to, to evaluate evidence for those things. The use of professional judgment, and, and we spent some time talking with the industry about the difference between the current process and the proposed process. And Jeff touched on it a little bit in terms of the current process being rooted in percentages and numbers and pass-fail situation, where in this case, it's, it's not pass-fail at all. It's about, it's about, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're, you're competent until you're proven otherwise. And if you're not competent, well, you're just not yet competent, and this is a process that shows you how to become competent, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, the training also had lots of specific examples, lots of opportunity to role play and actually practice the different parts of an assessment. And in terms of key learnings, that's one of the things that we found really valuable. Um, sometimes it sounds like common sense and it would be easy to do, but it's a little harder to do when you actually get into practice. So things like this competency conversation um, that, people, that people go through. The, the assessors work off a structured set of questions, but they need to be able to probe for more information. So it's not just a yes-no, you're not looking for a yes-no um, question. You're looking for an open-ended question that encourages the challenger to talk about what they've done in their whole range of experience. And you're looking for gaps, so you're trying to probe for where they don't have, where, where the information is not coming out or the evidence is not coming out. And then you use the different tools to solicit a variety of that evidence. So the quality of the assessors were key. We recruited some, what we think or who we think um, were the best and brightest in the industry, and there was a cross-section drawn almost half from the training institutions, so we had some instructors, and we had, um, maybe it wasn't half, it was maybe 60-40, um, a little more drawn directly from industry. So these were people um, working in high-end restaurants or hotels throughout the province. Um, a lot of them, uh, some of them had been, been um, involved in uh, world skills competitions, so we're quite used to judging in a uh, co competition. And we also had to talk about that in terms of, you know, the professional be judgment being exercised here is also different than in a competition. The challengers themselves. So who, who are the type of people that we assessed? Well, we had, we had 65 in total. And again, they were a cross-section of individuals, people with little or no formal training, and some, some people who had failed at writing that Red Seal exam. We had some foreign trade people, we had a couple with learning disabilities, one with a, as it turned out, quite a severe learning disability. And um, we, spent a, we spent a good amount of time, although not enough, it was a, another key learning that we took away, um, holding these briefing sessions for challengers. And one thing we found out is that you probably can never do enough preparation of these people. It takes, it takes um, a fair amount of time for, for the, to, to get challengers to understand and to get familiar with those standards. And it's pretty daunting. You, know, you take this big, thick book and, and basically you've got to say, well, this is what you need to know in order to, to be assessed. So, it, because if they come to the assessment and they don't understand what they're being measured against, then they might as well not be there. So the purpose of the briefings was to, was to expose them to that and as well help them identify what in their portfolio <coughs> could they package and submit that would, be, that, you know, that would be evidence of their competency. So things we learned, um, we need to use simpler language so that people understand what it is we're saying. We need to make the process less paper intensive. The first time through we had a form for everything um, and we said in terms of evidence, send us anything you can that proves that you, that you are a competent cook and we ended up with photographs and, and a whole pile of stuff and, and it didn't really work that well. Um, you know, there, in, in reality what you need is you need a resume, uh, you need a letter from employers that that um, is, a, is a testament to how you work in, you know, in, in the kitchen or, or your place of work. And you need a copy of any training or credentials that you already have. 
You know, those are the, the three key, key things to submit in your portfolio. And I've already mentioned in terms of preparation, we, 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 have, we tried a, um, a self-assessment tool, and it was a big flop. Um, the self-assessment tool set out all the standards, and, and it asked people to identify which ones that they've done. And everybody tipped off every, every single one of them. Oh, yeah, I've done that, I've done that. But what we found was that when, when it said, have you, made, uh, have you made soups and sauces? Everybody said yes. But to one person, making a soup and sauce was actually you know, receiving the ingredients and chopping them up and putting them in the pot and, and stirring it up and cooking it and serving it. To another person, it meant, well, I received you know, a, a bagged soup. It was frozen. And I cut open the container and I put it in the pot and I warmed it up and I served it. Why do you do soups? And same thing with sauces. So we had, we had, we're working on refining that. And uh, in, in what we're doing now, we're, we're going out with a second attempt, um, and we'll see how successful that one is. So <clears throat> the, um, the assessment methodology, um, again, it was that it's, it's uh, the use of five of the tools. It's about building that picture of competence. It's a holistic assessment. So there are some 42 uh, competency units in the Cook standards right now. And that doesn't mean 42 separate tests or uh, 42 different um, assessment tools. What that means is that, that the assessment is packaged so that one task actually assesses three or four different units. Um, so we're not there for weeks and weeks doing this assessment. And we did use all of the tools. So we used uh, the self-assessment, the portfolio of evidence, the written exam, competency conversation, and a practical. In the ideal, you, you might not do all that. You might have more of a customization to a person because it's about, again, it's about evident, evaluating that evidence and deciding what more evidence I need and how best to get, to get that depending on the characteristics of the challenger that's in front of you. So you might do it something differently. But we're not there yet. And, we're, and because we're new, we're building confidence in the approach. So we used all of the tools. And we, and we actually retained some of the current systems. So we didn't throw out, say, the proof of time in the trade. So these challengers still had to um, come in and prove with documented evidence that they had worked uh, X number of hours in the trade. What we did do was normally challengers have to work one and a half times the number of hours that a, an apprentice would work. And we, and we dropped it down to an apprentice. So they still had to meet that threshold. Now this is, so this is, this diagram actually shows the process that they went through starting with the self-assessment, which they did themselves. They did the application, um, then they came in for their written test and the competency conversation. And then they came for their practical on a different day, and if they were successful, they were issued the certification, and if they weren't, um, they went uh, and got some gap training or some experience. So how long did it take? Well, the assessments themselves were conducted over a three-week period, a lap elapsed time. Um, the competency conversation and the written test took about two hours. It's, it was only a, about a 30-question written test, so that maybe took half an hour. And the assessor actually marked it right then and there, and then again used that um, tool to determine where they needed to ask some questions, which they then went and did in the competency conversation. So that conversation um, could take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half or so. The practical was a full day, six hours, and it varied depending on the level that you were challenging for. So some of the um, key learnings there, lots of opportunities to streamline the process. Um, Things like all candidates should prepare the same items um, for efficiency instead of different items or items of their choice. Uh, again, streamline the paperwork. The costs, we figured out that it, 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 it costs approximately $1,000 per assessment. And there are definitely cost savings um, if to do more than one <coughs> person at a time. And in fact, it's not for us, um, it's not sustainable to do the one-on-one. On one. So in a practical, uh, we used uh, we used a variety of venues, so we used some training institutions. We also used some real kitchens, and the ideal um, is to be able to do six is, is to have six challengers per assessor in a practical exam. 
So what are the results? So in our, in our province, there are three levels, three certifications in the cook trade that you can challenge for. 65 people, 20, 24 achieved the red seal, which is the top, the full certification. Or not a full certification, the top level certification. 19 achieved um, professional cook two, and 12 achieved professional cook one. 10 were declared not yet competent, but I think the really exciting thing that we learned from this was that everybody took away something. So even of these 10 who were declared not yet com competent, most of them only missed the credential by about somewhere between three, three to eight competencies. And what they walked away with was a transcript of all 42, or I think at the time there were 38, all of those competencies, and it showed exactly the ones that they, are, they were deemed to be competent in and the ones that they were not yet competent in. So they then took those away, and they were able to get to either pick up gap training, and that training could have been from their employer, going back to their employer and saying, hey, I need some more practice in these areas. Can you set something up for me? They also worked in some cases with the assessors themselves. They said, hey, you know, can you help me develop a plan that would give me experience in these areas? And then they had the opportunity to come back and be reassessed. And they only had to be reassessed in the areas that they had missed. So yes, they did have to submit new evidence, but they didn't have to go through the entire process all over again. They, they decided what credential that they were going to apply for and, and, not, and in some cases, yeah, they, were, they applied for three and then we awarded two. And a I, couple applied for one or two, applied for two and actually got three. Is that yeah. Underestimated so it's there. almost like it's a whole stream going through and they, they get measured out into their confidence. Yeah, or in conversation with the assessor, the assessor can say, hey, look, you know what, it, 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 you don't really have enough evidence for three, but I think you're a good candidate for two or vice versa. Hey, you know, we're, we really think you should be challenging for three instead of two. So it works both ways. Um, so big, a uh, big learning there was in the gap training area. Um, obviously, I mean, in this, in in, the, in all of the countries that we looked at, this is a huge challenge: how to provide candidates with the opportunity to pick up um, experience in the areas that they're missing. So a little bit of direct feedback from uh, from people from the industry. Uh, Map ensures that only those who are truly competent in the trade are certified. Matt May gave a more complete picture of the challenges comp competence from the assessors. And from the challengers themselves, the process gave people a fair chance to demonstrate their competency. And because credit was gained for those units challengers did achieve, even if they didn't achieve a credential, it wasn't a pass-fail situation. And I, and I can't emphasize enough what a difference that was in terms of the environment not only for the challengers who were amazing because most of them were nervous but as soon as they got into the process it kind of evaporated because they they were so comfortable doing what they do on a day-to-day -day basis but even the assessors as well it was just a much nicer environment than, than than the whole stressful if i don't make it i fail completely and we and we changed our terminology we very much did you know try not to use the past fail or the fail word or the unsuccessful word and it's just about, it's about being competent or not yet being competent. And I wanted to um, finish up with Nay, who's also another of the challengers who went through the process. My birthplace is uh, at Cambodia. I was an uh, immigrant here in 1988. I had to do to get money to support my family. So. Whatever job available for me, I take. Finally, I got a job. And then after two years, the chef moved me to uh, working in a banquet. But he introduced me, he said, oh, this program coming up for the days here, if uh, I would like to uh, challenge it. I said, yeah, why not? And then he processed my name and application sent to uh, ITA, and then uh, I got approved, and then uh, I start uh, study from there. We had to do uh, three tests: first world goal, written exam, and uh, doing practicum. It's a little bit hard because my English is not like perfect, 
the cooking, I already know what to do. Yes, this is my first time. I like the challenge, challenging. I, I never can do something like this before. This is a, a big step. I could work anywhere in Canada. Red seal is like official. I didn't expect that I have my red seal one day, but this is like gold medal. It's not only for me, for people out there that they don't know about this program. He's just the best uh, poster boy. So, um, so there's a lot more activity underway. Uh, we've been continuing to pilot. The, at the national level, the Canadian Council of Directors of Apprenticeship have a, a set of consultations underway exploring these concepts and the idea of mo moving towards uh, a system that would strengthen the Red Seal program itself. In, um, in BC, we're continuing to assess people using this methodology in the cook trade and expanding, not, not expanding, but further piloting in other trades. Um, on, a, on a national project, we're undertaking the heavy duty equipment technicians and we're developing the standards and the assessment tools and the assessment strategy with national industry representatives. Um, with BC industry, we're doing uh, the tidal angling guide program in the, in the fishing industry, marine mechanical technician, and heavy equipment operator is, is coming up. We know that um, to build a, a system like this, we have 150 trades in the province, it's a huge endeavor to, um, to, to, to go further down this path and, and roll, roll this out. Um, there's, a, there's a big job in getting buy-in from industry and other stakeholders and there's a whole system to be built and, and the ne our next task is to put together a bit of a road map in terms of what do we need to do and when does it need to be done and, and what would the path look like um, to move towards this system. So that is our story with multiple assessment pathways.